Hello. Today's episode number 48 of the Professor Slots podcast discusses the current state of slot machine casino gambling in the great U.S. states of Louisiana, Maine, Maryland, and Massachusetts. Thank you for joining me for the Professor Slots podcast show. I'm John Friedel, and this is the podcast about slot machine casino gambling. It is where I provide knowledge, insights, and tools for helping you improve your slot machine gambling performance. John Friedel from the Professor Slots blog reveals all his tips and tricks for thriving in the casino environment. Choose winning slot machines and identify your gambling goals. Being entertained, earning comps, winning take-home cash, or combining them. In case you missed it, on my last episode, I went over big slots jackpots. Have a plan just in case. A special thanks to Richard from Gainesville, Georgia, for sharing his win of a $60,000 slots jackpot at Harris Cherokee Casino in Murphy, North Carolina. Further, I reviewed Kansas and Kentucky slot machine casino gambling 2018. I hope you enjoyed listening to my last episode as much as I enjoyed making it for you. Remember to visit professorslots.com slash subscribe to get my free report revealing the top seven online resources for improving your gambling performance, including the one I've used as a top-tier slot machine casino gambler. In this episode segment, I provide a brief overview of the current state of gambling in four U.S. states, territories, or federal district, emphasizing, by far, anything of interest to slot machine casino gamblers. Up first is Louisiana Slot Machine Casino Gambling 2018. Here goes. Louisiana Slot Machine Casino Gambling consists of 24 casinos of different types, including 15 riverboat casinos, one land-based casino, four paramutual casinos, and four tribal casinos. The gaming industry has become an important part of Louisiana's culture and economy. Paramutual wagering received state approval in the 1920s. The collapse of the state's oil-based industry in the 1980s, however, led to the extended presence of other forms of legalized gambling. The minimum legal gambling age in Louisiana depends upon the gambling activity. For land-based casinos, poker rooms, and the lottery, it's 21. For bingo and paramutual wagering, it's 18. Louisiana has had a long history of illegal casinos, with the state alternating between raiding illegal casino operations and ignoring them. Louisiana was the fourth U.S. state to legalize riverboat casinos. These gambling establishments received approval by the state in 1991 along with the return of the state lottery. In 1992, an added provision allowed a land-based casino in New Orleans. Negotiations began in 1993 for state tribal compacts with Louisiana's three federally recognized American Indian tribes. Each tribe opened their own tribal casino once these gaming compacts received approval, as required by the federal government. A fourth American Indian tribe federally recognized in 2002, negotiated a state tribal compact. They eventually gained U.S. Department of Interior approval as well. In 1997, efforts by paramutual racetracks to add slot machines to their facilities were eventually successful at three locations. Later, a fourth track received similar approval. Video Bingo is the primary type of electronic gaming machine available in Louisiana. According to Louisiana gaming regulations, these are legal slot machines or electronic gaming machines. However, the wording used in some parts of the state gaming regulations is ambiguous. For example, a loose definition for truck stops has allowed the addition and spread of video poker machines at many businesses across the state. I find this fascinating. When solving physics problems, it's important to carefully define terms to have any hope of solving the problem. Which direction is gravity again? I knew it was important to define terms in physics, but I was a bit taken aback with state gaming regulations having to do the same for gambling terms. It makes sense, though, if you think about it for a minute. I'd previously written a blog article and produced podcast episode number 15 on legal gaming classifications. You know that class 1 is tribal ceremonies, class 2 is competition-based games like bingo, and class 3 are all other forms of gambling. What's neat about these definitions, provided by the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, is that the act is a federal law. So for these gambling terms and these terms alone, all U.S. states, territories, and federal districts each have the same definition for them. Meaning, no other gambling term is necessarily the same from one state to another. This stuff matters because, at a high level, legal definitions for gambling define what is and is not gambling. For example, is poker gambling? Well, Nebraska says it isn't. For Louisiana, gaming regulations use the word truck stops without defining what a truck stop was. 
That meant bars and casinos could apply for a gaming license even if they weren't a truck stop because, well, trucks stopped there. I'm not a lawyer, but I think this is called a legal loophole, which you could figuratively drive a truck through. Which, when it comes to it, is exactly what businesses in Louisiana did. Next up is a usually short statement about slot machine private ownership, which I have included in case you live in this U.S. state and are considering owning a slot machine. Here it is. In Louisiana, it is legal to privately own a slot machine only if it is 25 years old or older. The Louisiana Gaming Control Board works closely with the Gaming Enforcement Division within the Louisiana State Police to regulate and control the gaming industry in Louisiana. In this section, I discuss Louisiana gambling establishments. As usual, when there are too many casinos to mention here, a complete list, along with links to their websites, assuming they've set one up, is available on my website blog article for this state at louisiana.com la. There are 23 casinos in Louisiana. Of these, 16 are non-tribal riverboat casinos. One is a land-based casino, four are paramutual racinos, and three are American Indian tribal casinos. The largest casino in Louisiana is Harris New Orleans Casino and Hotel, having 3,800 gaming machines and 105 table games. The second largest casino is Paragon Casino Resort in Marksville, owned and operated by the Tunica Biloxi Tribe and having 2,200 gaming machines and 45 table games. A complete list of the 20 non-tribal commercial casinos in Louisiana, along with links to the websites, is available on my website blog article for this state at professorslots.com slash LA. Three out of four Louisiana American Indian tribal casinos have negotiated tribal state compacts, allowing them to offer Class Three Vegas-style gaming. Gina Choctaw Pins Casino offers only Class Two competition-style games. The four tribal casinos in Louisiana are, again, available on my website blog article for this state at professorslots.com slash LA. As an alternative to enjoying Louisiana slot machine casino gambling, consider exploring casino options in a nearby state. Louisiana is bordered by, to the north, Arkansas, to the east, Mississippi, to the south, the Gulf of Mexico, and to the west, Texas. To read any of my articles on these U.S. states, simply visit professorslots.com followed by its two-letter state designation. For example, my Arkansas slots article is available at professorslots.com slash AR. Payout return legal limits are set at a minimum of 80% and a maximum of 99.9% for electronic gaming machines in Louisiana's casinos. For video poker machines not in casinos, the legal limits have been set to a minimum of 80% and a maximum of a 94%. I'm going to jump in here just for a second and point out something I've been thinking a lot about lately. Most states in which slots are legal have set a minimum payout return limit, but only a few have set a maximum payout return limit. It's this upper limit I'd like to comment on now. What does it mean to you if there is an upper payout return limit? If an upper limit has been set, I've yet to find one above 100%. Do you see the problem? Depending on how it is implemented, it shuts down winning slots strategies in that state. With this law in place, casinos can't choose to set up a slot machine to be a winning machine for all the good business reasons they might wish to use. Not for promotional purposes to show a winning machine so other players are encouraged to gamble on other machines, or as a way for casinos to balance their daily performance metrics by allowing a few jackpot wins the morning after a busy night. My point here is that legally established maximum payout return limits handicap both businesses and advantage players. I don't find playing slots fun if I'm not making money. If I wanted that, I'd just play online. I want a chance to win, which involves more than just luck. I'll need to produce a podcast episode going over all this, but there is some hope here. If you look at the details of state gaming regulations where maximum payout return has been defined, there are several different types. What I mean is, sometimes a state makes their legal limit more restrictive than others. For instance, the maximum limit may not be for individual slot machines, but rather for all slot machines as a whole at that location. I like this rule because some slot machines can still be set by the casino for any a number of good business reasons to be a winning slot machine. Another way to set a maximum payout return limit, which also isn't very restrictive at all, is when the details specify that the limit applies over the lifetime of the slot machine. Frankly, I can live with that. There might even be a specific advantage play possible for states with such a limit. 
But the maximum payout return limit, which I seriously have a problem with, is a daily limit on each individual slot machine. Playing slot machines with that type of legal limit means no slot strategies, no advantage plays can legally exist. Winning on those machines is entirely luck-based. As I've been explaining to a few of you over email conversations lately, I can't help you be more lucky. A large part of my job is to point out how casinos have set up their slot machines deliberately, and that choosing one slot machine over another can make you more of a winner. When a maximum limit is in place, particularly the restrictive kind, I'm limited to only being able to help you stretch your dollar to last longer. So certain types of legal limits prevent casinos from certain business practices, which we can take advantage of. In turn, this limits what I can offer you. I'm currently in my second round of 56 blog articles, one produced each week, including this one on Louisiana. In this second series, I provide the maximum payout return limit if it exists. However, I haven't always emphasized exactly which type of maximum these states have. In Series 3, I'll start doing so. Why? Because it matters. Now, back to Louisiana payout return statistics. The Louisiana Gaming Control Board provides annual and monthly reports on gaming revenue. However, these reports only provide overall actual payout return statistics for each of the four pyramidal Racino sites. Further, the Louisiana Gaming Control Board makes monthly revenue reports available for video poker, land-based casino, riverboat casinos, and slots at the track. Overall monthly payout returns at the four pyramidal Racinos are taxable net slot proceeds divided by total AGR. In October 2018, each of the four Racinos had an overall return of precisely 82.0%. Unfortunately, the other three revenue reports mentioned do not offer net slot proceeds. Without that, no payout returns are available on the Gaming Control Board for Video Poker, the Land-Based Casino, or Riverboat Casinos. Fortunately, the Gaming Enforcement Division has a monthly slot payout summary with detailed payout returns. Here, you'll find the monthly payout return for each slot machine denomination, but instead of by individual casinos, these are by state region. The four state regions in Louisiana with overall gaming statistics are as follows. 1. Baton Rouge with its four casinos. 2. Lake Charles with its four casinos. 3. New Orleans with its five casinos. And 4. Shreveport, Boisier City with its seven casinos. The September 2018 payout return statistics for these four regions are tabulated for your convenience on my website blog article for this state at professorslots.com slash LA. The regions with the highest and the lowest payout return for a specific slot machine denomination are in red. Averaged over all slot denominations, each region has a very similar payout return for September 2018. Note that these summary reports include the number of slot machines for each region and denomination. This can be very helpful. For instance, as I look at that table right now, there are only two slot machines with a $50 denomination in the Lake Charles region, yet their combined payout return is 97.1%. That's the highest return for any denomination in Lake Charles. One of these slot machines wins more than the other, most likely, and you'd only have to figure out which one it was, out of two, not out of 2,000. As is often the case with negotiated state travel compacts, any legal limits on payout returns for gaming machines and American Indian tribal casinos in Louisiana is unknown. However, the tribal state gaming compact between Louisiana and at least the Chittimaca tribe of Louisiana has a section 10-C-4 at the top of page 34, which states, quote, The stands and rules of each game and odds paid to winning bets shall be visually displayed or available in pamphlet form in the gaming facilities and operation. End quote. Does this mean each slot machine at Chittimaca Tribal Casinos has its individual payout returns available? If not, what does this mean? If you know, I'd ask that you contact me with that information. My contact information is available at the bottom of any of my web pages. Thanks. In summary, Louisiana slot machine casino gambling consists of 24 casinos, including 20 non tribal casinos and 4 tribal casinos. There are also video poker gaming machines located at many businesses across the state. Payout return limits are available for non-tribal casinos and non-casino sites. Actual payout return statistics are something of a mixed bag. They are publicly available from the Louisiana State Police Gaming Enforcement Division by state region and machine denomination. 
The four parametro racinos have site-specific payout returns available from the Louisiana Gaming Control Board. Over the last year, there has been little change in the state of slots gambling in Louisiana. Remember to visit ProfessorSlots.com slash subscribe to get my free report revealing the top seven online resources for improving your gambling performance, including the one I've used as a top-tier slot machine casino gambler. Up next is the second state comprising this podcast episode, Maine Slot Machine Casino Gambling 2018. Here goes. Maine Slot Machine Casino Gambling consists of three parimutuel racetrack casinos, two of which offer slot machines and table games. Maine also has four off-track betting sites. Bingo is available throughout the state. The minimum legal gambling age in Maine depends upon the gambling activity. For land-based casinos and poker rooms, it's 21. For bingo, the lottery, and paramutual wagering, it's 18. In 2003, Maine offered a referendum to its voters to approve slot machines at two racetracks. The residents of Bangor approved it, but the residents of the city of Scarborough did not. To this day, the racetrack in Scarborough does not offer slot machines. In 2010, voters in Oxford approved slot machines for their casino. The next year, the casino in Bangor approved table games. Now, Maine law allows two racetrack racinos. Maine's legal rights with regards to travel gaming are unusual relative to other states. The application of the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act does not apply here due to the Maine Indian Claims Settlement Act. Because of this legal precedent, and unlike most states with tribal gaming, tribal land in Maine is subject to state law. I'll need to give a bit more commentary here. Maine's tribal gaming laws really are different from other states. I've been through the state gaming regulations for all U.S. states, in fact, rather thoroughly, and only Texas has anything remotely similar. The basic idea here is like the chicken and the egg, meaning which came first. The Indian Gaming Regulatory Act is a federal law which came out in 1988. More specifically, because it turns out that this matters, it was officially signed into law by President Ronald Reagan on October 17, 1988. Just the year before, another federal act, called the Restoration Act of 1987, gave federal recognition to two tribes in Texas. That act came with conditions regarding gaming, and Texas argued in court that it takes precedence over the IGRA of 1988. I explain this further in my blog article for Texas at professorslots.com slash TX. But what about Maine? Well, here too the IGRA of 1988 was preceded by another federal law called, as I've mentioned, the Maine Indian Claims Settlement Act of 1980. My research on this act has been interesting, to say the least. I'm from Michigan, so I'm familiar and comfortable with having reservations all around. It's part of my culture and upbringing. In Michigan, the tribes are sovereign nations. All my life, I've taken this as a given in all other states. In legal terms, and again, I'm not a lawyer, so this is just me talking about what I've read, another way to say tribes have sovereignty is, quote, live claims of aboriginal title in the United States, end quote. Apparently, it's also known as, quote, original Indian title, end quote, and, quote, Indian right of occupancy, end quote. The U.S. was the first to acknowledge this common law. Anyway, it can only be revoked by an act of Congress. Do you see now where this is going? Maine revoked it for their state in 1980 through a Maine Indian Claims Settlement Act through the U.S. Congress. As a result, Maine tribes are subject to state laws, including state of Maine gaming regulations. As an aside, the only other state in which the U.S. Congress has revoked Indian right of occupancy is Rhode Island via the Rhode Island Claims Settlement Act. Finally, there are more than a few other claim settlement acts in other U.S. states, as well as Canada, but they do not fully extinguish all Aboriginal title as Maine and Rhode Island have. These other acts, like those in Florida, relate only to water rights. More than a few acts are still in process. Regarding slot machine private ownership, it is legal to privately own a slot machine in Maine. The Gaming Control Bureau for the state of Maine is the Gambling Control Unit. There are two non-tribal casinos and one paramutual racetrack in Maine. In addition, Maine has four parimutuel betting sites. The largest casino in Maine is Hollywood Casino Hotel and Racetrack Bangor, having 923 gaming machines and 16 table games. The only other casino with slot machines is Oxford Casino, having 800 gaming machines and 22 table games. Maine's three non-tribal casinos and racinos are 1. Hollywood Casino Hotel and Raceway Bangor, found 128 miles northeast of Portland. 2. Oxford Casino, found 43 miles north of Portland. And three, Scarborough Downs Racetrack, 
located 10 miles southwest of Portland. Maine has four federally recognized American Indian tribes. State law permits them to offer high-stakes bingo games without restriction on the size of prizes. The Penobscot High Stakes Bingo Casino recently offered 1,800 bingo seats and pull tab gambling, but has permanently closed. As an alternative to enjoying Maine slot machine casino gambling, consider exploring casino options in a nearby state. Maine is bordered by, to the east, the Canadian province of New Brunswick, to the northwest, the Canadian province of Quebec, to the south, the Atlantic Ocean, and to the west, New Hampshire. To visit my article on the state of New Hampshire, simply visit ProfessorSlots.com followed by its two-letter designation. That's ProfessorSlots.com slash NH. Maine law requires payout returns have a minimum of 89% on all electronic gaming machines. There is no maximum legal limit for payout returns. Note that the state law requirement applies to Class II bingo-style gaming machines offered by Maine's tribes. Maine's Gambling Control Unit offers revenue information for each casino. This information is monthly, except for the most recent month, which is weekly. This reporting includes average slots win percent, which, when subtracted from 100%, provides the payout return percentage for slots players. For October 2018, Hollywood Casino Hotel and Raceway Bangor had a payout return of 89.84%, and the Oxford Casino had a payout return of 89.96%. In summary, main slot machine casino gambling consists of two paramutual racinos offering slot machines and table games. The third racetrack offers only paramutual wagering. The minimum legal limit for payout returns is 89%. Actual payout return statistics are available by month except for the most recent month, which are available weekly. In the last year, the Penobscot High Stakes Bingo Casino in Old Town has permanently closed. Remember to visit ProfessorSlots.com slash subscribe to get my free report revealing the top seven online resources for improving your gambling performance, including the one I've used as a top-tier slot machine casino gambler. Up next is a second state comprising this episode segment, Maryland Slot Machine Casino Gambling 2018. Here goes. Maryland Slot Machine Casino Gambling consists of six casinos. These land-based casinos offer only Video Lottery Terminal, VLT, style slot machines. Maryland also has cruise ships offering onboard gambling options when traveling to international waters. A minimum payout return percentage has been legally set by Maryland law. However, actual payout return statistics are not publicly available. Other gambling locations exist in Maryland, such as bingo halls and paramutual wagering facilities, but none are legally allowed to have slot machines. The minimum legal gambling age in Maryland depends upon the gambling activity. For land-based casinos and poker rooms, it's 21. For bingo, the lottery, and paramutual wagering, it's 18. Further, anyone intoxicated is prohibited from playing VLTs per state law. Also, cruise ships out of Baltimore have a minimum legal gambling age of 18. I wonder what the details are for intoxicated individuals being prohibited from gambling. How does the casino decide if someone is intoxicated? Further, is alcohol even offered at Maryland's six casinos? Are only obviously intoxicated individuals prohibited? I doubt anyone is subjected to a breathalyzer test. Maybe alcoholic beverages are counted per individual with a limit on how many are consumed in an hour. I've certainly heard of such limits elsewhere. When I just went to the websites of Maryland's casinos, I do see that they have pubs in the casino offering alcohol. I've just tried reaching out to a couple of main casinos, but wasn't able to get an answer if alcohol was even allowed on the casino floor, much less how individuals are identified as being intoxicated. Perhaps you've gambled at one of Maryland's casinos? If so, would you mind letting me know if alcohol is served on the casino floor? And if you have any observations to offer about what happens if someone has too much to drink? Just leave a message at 937-696-0086 or email me at john at professorslots.com where john is spelled J-O-N. Thanks. In 2008, Maryland voters approved a constitutional amendment authorizing slot machines at five locations in the state. This included a licensing and regulatory legal framework for casino operators, employees, and contractors, as well as specifying where to spend state gaming proceeds. In 2012, Maryland voters approved a gaming expansion bill legally allowing table games at Maryland casinos. It also allowed a sixth Maryland casino. This gambling license was awarded in December 2013, resulting in MGM National Harbor opening three years later. Regarding slot machine private ownership, it is legal to privately own a slot machine in Maryland if it is 25 years old or older. 
The Maryland Lottery and Gaming Control Commission, along with the Gaming Control Agency, are responsible for gaming regulations. Together, for each gambling facility, they oversee 1. Internal controls 2. Auditing and accounting procedures 3. Safety and security 4. Surveillance 5. Employee background investigation and licensing 6. Day-to-day operation of machines 7. Compliance and 8. Responsible gambling program There are six non-tribal casinos, one non-tribal casino, two cruise ships based in Maryland, and no tribal casinos. The largest casino in Maryland is Live Casino and Hotel in Handover, reported having 3,813 VLTs and 198 table games in November 2018. The second largest casino is MGM Casino National Harbor in Oxon Hill, reported having 3,136 VLTs and 198 table games. A complete list of the six casinos and two cruise ships in Maryland offering VLT-style slot machines are available on my website blog article for this state at professorslots.com slash md. Maryland has no tribal casinos. In part, this is due to Maryland having no federally recognized American Indian tribes. As an alternative to enjoying Maryland slot machine casino gambling, consider exploring casino options in a nearby state. Maryland is bordered by, to the north, Pennsylvania, to the east, Delaware, to the south, Virginia, and the District of Columbia, and to the west, West Virginia. To visit any of my articles on these U.S. states, simply visit ProfessorSlots.com followed by its two-letter state designation. For example, my Pennsylvania Slots article is available at ProfessorSlots.com slash PA. With regards to gambling in Maryland, it's important to consider its neighboring states. Of its five neighbors, only Pennsylvania offers a good assortment of slot machines. West Virginia has slots at only five locations, and Delaware has three racinos, while the District of Columbia and Virginia have no slots at all. So if you're in Delaware, the District of Columbia, Virginia, or West Virginia, then Maryland is a great go-to destination for slot machine casino gambling. From what I've heard regarding heavy traffic at Maryland casinos, along with high limits at craps tables, Maryland casinos are aware of this. It's an interesting dynamic, though. For how many years is this going to be sustainable? As I've mentioned before, the state of gambling in the U.S. is dynamic with significant changes every year. Just look at sports gambling ever since the U.S. Supreme Court ruling last year. When will gambling be expanded in Maryland's neighbors, and what effect will it have on Maryland casinos? Frankly, I think it'll make them more competitive, but it will likely be a mess getting to that point. Just look at the border war, if I may be so dramatic, occurring between Connecticut and Massachusetts since the MGM Springfield was planned much less since it opened last year. Maryland state gaming regulations require an average minimum payout return of 87% for each VLT gaming machine. Further, each casino licensee must establish an average payout return percentage between 90% and 95% overall for their VLT machines. In summary, Maryland slot machine casino gambling consists of six casinos with VLT-style slot machines controlled by the Maryland Gaming Control Board. Further, two cruise ships sailing out of the port of Baltimore offer casino gambling via slot machines while traveling to international destinations. Over the last year, the largest casino in Maryland reduced their number of VLT-style slots from 4,337 to 3,813, a 12% reduction, while table games increased from 125 to 198. The second largest casino only had a 5% decrease in slots, but table games increased from 140 to 198. Remember to visit ProfessorSlots.com slash subscribe to get my free report revealing the top seven online resources for improving your gambling performance, including the one I've used as a top-tier slot machine casino gambler. Up next is the next state comprising this podcast episode, Massachusetts Slot Machine Casino Gambling 2018. Here goes. Massachusetts Slot Machine Casino Gambling consists of the MGM Springfield, a slot parlor in Plain Ridge, and a cruise ship sailing to international destinations. Massachusetts has set a legal minimum payout return for slot machines. No actual payout returns are made publicly available. The minimum legal gambling age in Massachusetts depends upon the gambling activity. For land-based casinos and poker rooms, it's 21. For bingo, the lottery, and paramutual wagering, it's 18. In late 2011, the governor approved a bill allowing three land-based casino resort gaming licenses to be located in three gaming regions of Massachusetts. 1. Eastern Region A. This license went to MGM, who constructed a casino in downtown Springfield. It opened on August 24, 2018. 2. Western Region B. 
This license went to Wynn Resorts, who is constructing Encore Boston Harbor in Everett. It is planning to open in the summer of 2019. And three, Southeastern Region C. This license has not yet been awarded. Massachusetts gaming regulations define Category 1 and Category 2 casinos as follows. A Category 1 casino pays a daily tax of 25% of gross gaming revenue and requires appropriate documentation of infrastructure improvements on-site and around the vicinity of the gaming establishment. Category 2 casinos pay a daily tax of 40% of gross gaming revenue, pay an additional daily assessment of 9% of its gross gaming revenue, appropriate documentation of infrastructure improvements, and is limited to 1,500 gaming positions. Massachusetts Law, Section 97 of Chapter 194, includes a research initiative. This section is a legal requirement to collect customer tracking data from 1. Loyalty programs, 2. Player tracking software, 3. Player card systems, and 4. Online gambling transactions or any other information system. Interestingly, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has engaged a nonprofit research group to make this player data anonymous by removing personally identifying information such as player name, address, and bank or credit information. Further, the gaming manufacturers also have their data removed to protect corporate intellectual property. This includes game identifying information such as device name and the name of the manufacturer. Gameplay data kept includes player characteristics. The law is clear that Massachusetts is not legally limited to collecting only the following. 1. Frequency, length, speed, and denomination of play. 2. Amounts wagered, including the number of lines and hands played. And 3. Real configuration, return to player, RTP, the volatility index, and denomination. This anonymized behavioral data will be sent to a research facility to conduct analyses to improve the understanding of how gambling addiction grows and changes help develop strategies to minimize harm to players, and to develop systems to monitor, detect, and intervene in high-risk gambling situations in an ongoing manner. I'm going to throw in some commentary here, which is that none of this data analysis is necessarily bad. It might even be helpful. How would you know if it was helpful if you didn't check? But as this may be the most important aspect of all this, the data has been anonymized. I do question exactly what's going to happen if they do have this information, how they're going to intervene, as they say, with high-risk gambling situations in an ongoing manner. What is that going to look like? But this means your privacy and the intellectual property of slots manufacturers has been protected. This condition has been clearly stated within Massachusetts state gaming regulations. So, you know, there's that. I wonder if any of this data will eventually be made publicly available. I'd really like to see a study based on it. It should be very interesting. When Iowa recently requested two companies perform an analysis of Iowa gambling, several interesting trends came out of it. You can find my thoughts on those Iowa studies at professorslots.com slash IA or my podcast episode number 46. Regarding slot machine private ownership, it is legal to privately own a slot machine in Massachusetts if it is 30 years old or older. The Massachusetts Gaming Commission, also known on its website as Mass Gaming, was signed into law on November 22, 2011 by Governor Deval Patrick via the Expanded Gaming Act. Mass Gaming has an extensive Frequently Asked Questions section useful to players, but also those wishing to be approved by the state to work or have a career in the Massachusetts gaming industry. Massachusetts is a prime example of why I have an annually updated online resource for state gaming regulations and other changes. For this state, there's a lot going on quickly. The state of gaming being a dynamic environment is a primary reason for my recent decision to move my podcast state-by-state episodes to be more in sync with the publication date of my website blog articles. That's why I'm presenting four today in this podcast. I'm already doing it for the articles, but I'd be more helpful to you if my latest information were more immediately available for you, my dear podcast listener. Not two months old. In terms of advantage plays, this short delay occasionally matters. There is currently one non-tribal casino, zero American Indian tribal casinos, one non-tribal casino, and one cruise ship based in Massachusetts. The largest casino in Massachusetts is MGM Springfield, having 2,500 gaming machines and 125 table games. The second largest is currently the only other casino in Massachusetts, Plain Ridge Park Casino in Plainville, having over 1,200 gaming machines and electronic table games. Once it opens, Encore Boston Harbor will be the largest casino in Massachusetts, 
if the Tribal Casino ever opens, Project First Light Resort and Casino will be its second largest casino. There are currently two open casinos in Massachusetts offering slot machines, plus a planned casino. One, Encore Boston Harbor, is a planned casino expected to open in the summer of 2019. It is located five miles north of downtown Boston. Two, MGM Springfield, located 92 miles west of Boston and 26 miles north of Hartford, Connecticut, is a few miles from the Connecticut border. And three, Plain Ridge Park Casino, located 36 miles southwest of Boston and 22 miles northeast of Providence, Rhode Island, near the border to Rhode Island. The cruise ship out of Port of Boston is the NLC Dawn from Norwegian Cruise Lines, where international gambling is allowed with 199 slot machines. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts and Mashpee Wapatong Tribe have signed a tribal state gaming compact governing tribal gaming in southeastern Massachusetts, which includes Bristol, Plymouth, Nantucket, Dukes, and Barnstable counties. This compact was approved as required by the U.S. Department of Interior. The first light resort and casino by this tribe has been planned for Taunton. However, progress on this tribal casino resort has been subject to lawsuits. Construction has been on hold since mid-2016. It is uncertain whether the casino will ever be completed. As an alternative to enjoying Massachusetts slot machine casino gambling, consider exploring casino options in a nearby state. Massachusetts is bordered by, to the north, New Hampshire and Vermont, to the east, the Atlantic Ocean, to the south, Connecticut and Rhode Island, and to the west, New York. To visit any of my articles on these U.S. states, simply visit ProfessorSlots.com followed by its two-letter designation. For example, my New Hampshire Slots article is available at ProfessorSlots.com slash NH. Massachusetts law has set a minimum payout return percentage of 80% for gaming machines, established through modification of LLC standard GLI-11 gaming devices from Gaming Laboratories International. This minimum limit is calculated to provide acquisition cost of complementary merchandise and the value of promotional gaming credit. Monthly revenue reports from Mass Gaming provide actual payout returns for each of Massachusetts open casinos. These reports are currently available for MGM Springfield and Plain Ridge Park Casino. The MGM Springfield revenue report shows a November 2018 payout return of 92.10%. The payout return for this casino has increased month over month since the casino opened in August of 2018, starting with a slot payout of 89.88%. The Plain Ridge Park Casino revenue report shows a November 2018 payout return of 92.20% the highest slots payout return for this casino since January 2018. The Plain Ridge Park Casino Revenue Report shows a November 2018 payout return of 92.20%. In summary, Massachusetts slot machine casino gambling consists of one casino resort, a slots parlor, and an international cruise ship. MGM Springfield opened in August 2018 with Encore Boston Harbor planned for mid-2019. The minimum limit for slot machine payout return is 80%. Monthly actual payout return statistics are publicly available for each of the open casinos in Massachusetts. If you're interested in slot machine casino gambling in Massachusetts, then you will want to know as much as possible about the MGM Springfield Casino, which opened last year. And for lots and lots of detail about this casino located in downtown Springfield, you'll want to consider subscribing to Art in the Game by Christopher DeMora, a relatively new podcast devoted to all things MGM Springfield. I've recommended them before, and they're still doing well. I could wish for more local casinos within various states. Of course, lots of recreational podcasts are about Las Vegas. Too many to mention here. Okay, fine. I'll mention a few of them. There's Five Hundy by Midnight, an original recreational gambling podcast. They're up to nearly 700 episodes. Gambling with an Edge by Bob Dancer and Richard Munchkin, formerly a long-running radio show. There is one entirely about Atlantic City casinos called Do For a Win, and Podcast Casinos USA by Coach Fav will often talk about casinos in the Midwestern states. Also, of course, there's Cousin Vito's Casino Podcast, which covers Connecticut casinos. There are a few others. But my point here isn't to promote these other podcasts. Not directly, anyway. My point is to offer you, yes, you, a suggestion. You like going to casinos, Yes. And you like podcasts, right? So what state are you in, and why don't you start a recreational gambling podcast for your city or state? After all, you have boots on the ground where you are, and all that. 
If you are considering making your hobby into a podcast, whether it be about gambling or not, and you want help getting started, consider reaching out to the guy that helped me figure out the basics of podcasting, Dave Jackson from the School of Podcasting. He's been podcasting since 2005, was recently inducted into the Podcasting Hall of Fame, and has an online school for getting started in podcasting. I've made an easy way to remember his website because I've made a shortcut. Just go to professorslots.com slash SOP, and it'll take you right to his page. Fair warning, that's an affiliate link, meaning Dave sends a little finder's fee my way at no additional cost to you if you sign up. Anything I receive goes to paying my bills for this Professor Slots business. My first affiliate link was from Amazon, where they send me a small cut if you go to Amazon by clicking on the Amazon books shown on my website. With this second affiliate link to the School of Podcasting, I am continuing to offer links to products and services I think you might find useful. Eventually, as my business grows, I'll be in a better negotiating position with Amazon and others, and you had better believe it, I'll be trying for any discount I can get you. It's still too early for that, though, unfortunately. But patience. In the last year, the MGM Springfield in downtown Springfield opened in southern Massachusetts near the Connecticut border. Remember to visit ProfessorSlots.com slash subscribe to get my free report revealing the top seven online resources for improving your gambling performance, including the one I've used as a top-tier slot machine casino gambler. Part one of the next episode of the Professor Slots podcast is a review of a YouTube video with several slots tips, which I'll evaluate and comment on. I found out about this YouTube from a listener. Thanks, Leslie. If you know of an interesting slots-related website, book, or YouTube video, you'd like me to review for you to see if there are anything useful in it for you and I, just let me know. To make a suggestion or ask a question which might end up as a blog article or on a podcast episode, email it to john at professorslots.com, where John is spelled J-O-N, or by calling 937-696-0086 to leave a three-minute or less voicemail. I also appreciate your casino trip reports about slots. Part two of the next episode of the Professor Slots podcast are more brief overviews of the current state of gambling in two U.S. states, territories, or federal district. Next time, I'll be talking to you about the great U.S. states of Michigan and Minnesota. That's the end of another great episode of the Professor Slots podcast. Thanks so much for listening. Show notes for this episode are now available within most podcast apps, but are also available on my website at professorslots.com slash e48. I plan to have the next episode come out very soon for you, where I'll have more amazing content for the show. Until the next episode, have fun, be safe, and make good choices. Bye.